the Second World War, a podcast by Stephen Bedard. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash hopesreason. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. I'm eager to get to the German invasion of Poland and the dawn of World War II, but this is not going to be the episode. I want to pull back the reins a bit and look at what the other members of the Axis were doing leading up to this moment. So let's dive in. Let's begin with the furthest away from Poland and the activity of Japan. Before Japan was fighting what we call the Second World War, they were already fighting the Second Sino-Japanese War. A second war presupposes a first war, and the First Sino-Japanese War took place between China and Japan, with China losing. China was in rough shape at the outset of the war. The Republic of China had only been created in 1912, and ever since then there had been near constant fighting among various warlords. In 1929, there was a Sino-Soviet war right in the area that Japan was interested in. The Soviets won, causing the Japanese to feel a sense of urgency to claim control of Manchuria before the Soviets did. This was especially on their mind as Japan had, in the early 1900s, fought against Russia and tensions were still high. In 1830, the Central Plains War broke out in China, which included the Communist Party of China. China was in a vulnerable state, especially being next to Japan, a nation that worked hard to develop its industry and military. Japan saw Manchuria as having the resources that Japan needed to achieve their goals in Asia. While Japan was a prosperous nation, their tiny island did not have enough for them to attain their desired ambitions. Like Germany and Europe, Japan used an excuse to invade China. Japan had been given certain rights after the Russo-Japanese War in this area, and they claimed that those rights had been violated. As a result, on September 19, 1931, the Japanese invaded Manchuria. In 1932, Japan created the puppet state of Manchukuo. Conflict continued as Japan expanded its reach and created buffer zones between its conquered territories and Nanjing. Japan was most successful in the north, and the Mongol military government was established with Japanese support in 1936. Things really began to escalate in 1937. On July 7, 1937, there was conflict between the Japanese and Chinese on the Marco Polo Bridge in Beijing. This ultimately led to the fall of Beijing. This also led to the Tungchao Mutiny, in which the Chinese attacked the Japanese garrison, as well as civilians, leaving many dead. This outraged those in Japan and helped pave the way for what would take place. In August, the Chinese attacked the Japanese in Shanghai, known as the Battle of Shanghai. This attack was by land and air. The expectation was that the Japanese would easily overpower the Chinese with their much more sophisticated air force. However, the Chinese showed remarkable resistance. Still, the Japanese were able to land massive numbers of reinforcements and to overwhelm their Chinese opponents. This was followed by the Japanese capture of Nanjing. To give you an idea of how that went, this event is also known as the Nanjing Massacre, or the Rape of Nanjing. Many thousands of Chinese, including civilians, were killed and thousands of women were raped. The exact numbers are controversial, but what is clear is that it was bad. Really bad. In 1938, there were mixed schools when it came to the Japanese. Many of the government were satisfied with their control of northern China and the area around Shanghai. Remember, at this time, a potential conflict with the Soviet Union was a real possibility. But the Japanese military were drunk with victory. Major Chinese cities began to fall and massive air raids on civilian populations began. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning of what continued in other theaters during the Second World War. Where was Germany in all this? Not where you would think. Initially, Germany was in the role of supporting China and not Japan. The Germans worked with the Chinese to industrialize and militarize their nation. Ironically, some of the credit for the Chinese resistance to the Japanese was due to the German training and development. 
The Germans also helped them to produce weapons as their existing arsenal was subpar. So what happened? Well, Japan had much more to offer Germany, at least militarily. Plus, Germany was much more focused on the danger of the Soviet Union, even during the time of their non-aggression pact. China signed a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union in 1937, which didn't exactly put them in Hitler's good books. Japan, however, still had a tense relationship with the Soviets, and had even beaten them in their previous conflict. While Japan couldn't benefit Germany economically as much as China, it did feed into Hitler's obsession with the Soviet Union, and that is where Japan was at the dawn of the Second World War. So let's shift gears and get ourselves a bit closer to Germany and Poland by looking at what Italy was up to. Italy became a fascist state in 1935 with the doctrine of fascism, which stated, quote, The fascist conception of the state is all-embracing. Outside of it, no human or spiritual values can exist, much less have value. Thus understood, fascism is totalitarian, and the fascist state, a synthesis and a unit inclusive of all values, interprets, develops, and potentiates the whole life of a people. Part of Benito Mussolini's rhetoric was about reigniting the glories of the Italian past and creating a new Roman Empire. The Roman myth was as important to Mussolini as the Aryan myth was to Hitler. Rome became great by expanding beyond its borders and absorbing other nations. Mussolini wanted the same thing for Italy. Unfortunately for Mussolini, Italy was no Roman Empire. Mussolini had his eyes on numerous areas around the Mediterranean, and he desired to make it an Italian sea. Italy's major attempt at military aggression was against Ethiopia. This is known as the Second Italo-Ethiopian War. Like the Japanese in China, the second presupposes a first. There was a first Italo-Ethiopian War in the late 1800s, one in which Italy didn't do that well. The Italo-Ethiopian Treaty of 1928 defined the borders between Italian Somaliland and Ethiopia. In late 1934, a joint British and Ethiopian commission were surveying the border. They encountered a fort at Walwal, manned by Somalis and led by Italian officers. And the British and the Ethiopians wanted to accomplish their task peacefully, but they came into conflict with the Italians. Shots were fired and people were killed. This led to the Abyssinian Crisis. The Italians began to increase their military presence along the Ethiopian border. Britain and France allowed this as they hoped to make Italy an ally against Germany. Remember that in the First World War, Italy sided with France and Britain against Germany. In fact, in January 1935, a Franco-Italian agreement pretty much let Italy do whatever it wanted in that area of Africa. Things would come to a head in 1935. Italian forces to be used in Ethiopia were placed under the command of Emilio de Bono. On October 3, 1935, the Italians crossed over from Eritrea to Ethiopia. This was done without a declaration of war by Italy, but Ethiopia declared war on Italy as a response. Italy struggled in their advance largely because of the lack of good roads. It should be mentioned that Ethiopia was led by its emperor, Haleil Selesi I. A lot could be said about this figure. He was considered to be a descendant of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Today, Rastafarians consider him not only the Messiah, but God incarnate. This could take us down a long rabbit hole. It's enough to say that he wasn't just another ruler and his followers were devoted to him. A major setback for the Ethiopians and a propaganda victory for the Italians was the surrender of Selesi's son-in-law. De Bono was a good military leader and he systematically took city after city. He was in no rush and was concerned to keep his supply lines secure. Unfortunately, Mussolini wanted things to go faster. He promoted De Bono to Marshal of Italy and replaced him in the invasion with Pietro Badoglio. In December 1935, the Hor-Laval Pact was proposed by Britain and France. This would give Italy some of the best of the country they had just invaded, but it would allow Ethiopia to continue in some state. It was in some ways a precursor of the Munich Agreement. While Mussolini was open to it, it did fall apart. 
the Ethiopians still had some fight in them, and they initiated a Christmas offensive that hit the Italians hard, but it wasn't enough. A second offensive by the Italians began in 1936, this time including poison gas. The Italians and Eritreans came at them with strong forces. The Ethiopians fought hard with repeated counterattacks, but the Italians and their allies were too strong. Eventually, Addis Ababa fell and Selesi fled to the United Kingdom. But even so, Ethiopia wasn't completely conquered. At this point, only about half of Ethiopia was occupied, and even by the beginning of the Second World War, Italy wasn't fully in control of Ethiopia. Italy, while fairly victorious in Ethiopia, still struggled. This was a foretaste of what was to come. Things would be much worse for their invasion of Albania, but that's a story for another day. So as Germany prepared to invade Poland, Japan was busy with China and Italy was busy with Ethiopia. Soon all of these assorted conflicts would coalesce into the Second World War. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Second World War podcast. For you, the listeners of the Second World War podcast, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. My recommended audiobook is The Japanese Invasion of Manchuria and the Rape of Nanking, the history of the most notorious events of the Second Sino-Japanese War. For countries attempting to shake off their feudal past and enter a dynamic era of industrialization, Manchuria's resources presented an irresistible lure with immense natural resources coupled to economic activity more concentrated than elsewhere in China. This region, abutting Mongolia, Korea, the Yellow Sea, and the Great Wall, accounted for 90% of China's oil, 70% of its iron, 55% of its gold, and 33% of its trade. If Shanghai remained China's commercial center, by 1931 Manchuria had become its industrial center. Thus, it's not altogether surprising that Japan's invasion of Manchuria in 1931 resulted from a long, complex chain of historical events stretching back to the late 19th century, approximately 380,000 square miles in extent, or 1.4 times the size of the American state of Texas. Manchuria came into Imperial Russia's possession in 1900 due to the Boxer Rebellion in China. But the Russians held it only briefly. Their defeat in the Russo-Japanese War shook loose their control from important parts of Manchuria by the end of 1905. The Japanese gained two important footholds in Manchuria thanks to their victory. One consisted of Port Arthur, renamed Ryojun by the Japanese, an economically and strategically vital harbor city on the Liaodong Peninsula, plus the peninsula itself. The other comprised the South Manchurian Railway, which the Russians gave to the Japanese as a prize of war, in lieu of cash indemnity. Three days of plundering traditionally befell cities taken by storm, a fate usually avoided by those surrendering before the first attacking soldier penetrated beyond the outer walls. In Europe, in areas influenced by Enlightenment thinkers, this practice faded rapidly after the Napoleonic Wars. In 1937, however, as the Imperial Army of Japan invaded China, this custom returned in a horrifying new form, the Rape of Nanking, or the Nanking Massacre, a bloodbath lasting more than six weeks and possibly claiming more than a quarter million lives. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash hopesreason. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash hopesreason for your free audiobook. To find both blog posts and other episodes of the podcast, please visit me at stephenjbedard.com slash secondworldwar, and please consider supporting me at patreon.com slash hopesreason. Thank you, and God bless.